Hello, everybody. It's great to have you here. It's John Kranz with Compass Games Live. It's episode 71 this evening. It's February 10th, and it's great to have you here. Hope everybody's doing really well. Looking forward to tonight's broadcast, where we'll have our special guest joining us in a moment, Gilbert Collins. So we're look very much actually Gilbert's a repeat uh, visitor with us. Uh, we had him on back in November of 2020 uh, talking about War for America, and we're going to talk a little bit more about War for America this evening for sure as well as another project that uh, Gilbert's getting wrapped up right now. So really looking forward to tonight. As we customarily like to do, we want to just quickly go through the schedule with you all and just touch upon a few highlights uh, before we get into uh, welcoming Gilbert tonight. And again, uh, you'll notice really no change to the, uh, since last week's town hall, we haven't changed the release schedule. Uh, lots and lots of comments coming through about, and including tonight, by the way, about, uh, oh, uh, yes, the Third World War shipping yet. Is it shipping yet? So uh, last week, uh, uh, Bill Thomas mentioned he was targeting the 14th uh, of this month for the games to, to start shipping the Third World War. And uh, I won't say anything beyond that. I'm sworn to secrecy, so I'm not going to say whether you might find out the game's trickling out a little before that. All I can say is there's a lot of orders to process. So... Um, this is this is going to be a little crazy, but we're really excited to get the Third World War uh, finally out to everybody. It's been a long wait, but I think it will definitely be worth it. So, yes, officially the 14th of this month, February, which is, yeah, four days from now. But, yeah, maybe, who knows, maybe Bill will uh, get a few copies out the door a little earlier than that. We'll find out. 
Of course, we're going to talk about War for America tonight. We've we've already covered the Third World War. We had a recent uh, episode, maybe two, three months ago. We had Frank Chadwick on talking about the history of the game, as well as some members of our project team for the Third World War. Uh, so we did that just recently. So I thought now's gr a great time, actually, to have Gilbert on again, to visit with Gilbert again, see how he's doing and talk a little bit about War for America, maybe take some more of your questions that you may, might have about War for America as well, and then we'll delve into uh, this other project that uh, Gilbert's been working on for the past year. Uh, so those are the two we've talked about already, and then Barbarians at the Gates will follow after that. Also, we'll be inserting Paper Wars 100. We'll get inserted somewhere between, I think, War for America and Barbarian at the Gates. It's not on this schedule right here, but yeah, I should probably get Paper Wars 100 slotted in here. And then the African Campaign uh, Deluxe, which means it's gonna be a mounted map, some updated components. Some of the errata obviously got taken care of, uh, I think with the map and maybe the rules got cleaned up a little bit. So all that's coming in the Deluxe Edition. So I know a lot of folks are looking forward to that. So speaking of more information from Compass, we did send out this morning, and really the headliner was, because uh, there really isn't any new information or no new announcements per se since last week. So really, we just led with the live broadcast, which is obviously, if I refresh this page, you'll see time, the clocks run out, because we're now live in session. So looking forward to starting that here with uh, uh, Gilbert shortly. We had a great town hall with Bill uh, last week. He'll be back again a week from tonight. Uh, again, obviously, the last product we shipped is uh, St. Lo. Uh, and again, clarifications, I, I think there is some confusion about St. Lo. And again, it's not, it's uh, it's something that Jack Green put together, uh, Admiralty House Publications and with uh, War Drum Games, a uh, Japanese company. So we we're able to help Jack out just with distribution of the game. So we we're able to sell the game direct. And just to answer the question, great, great question came up last week. Why is Compass not uh, selling the game uh, to distributors so it gets into retail? That's because we just simply don't have enough copies uh, to, to get it out for retailers. We have to take care of the direct customers and we have limited supplies on hand. Uh, but we're, we're really, uh, it's a pleasure to work with Jack Green who's done so many great things uh, sorry, I meant to say Quarter Deck International. I think I said something else, but Jack's with uh, not Admiralty House. He's with Quarter Deck International, and uh, and uh, yeah, we're happy to work with them to to do that. And again, of course, we're going to talk about the War for America. That's one of our upcoming releases, obviously, right after Third World War, actually. So we're going to talk about that. We've talked about the subscription many, many times. Uh, definitely check out Vassal if, if you're looking. If you don't have table space like myself. That Vassal is great, and there's a lot more games on uh, Vassal now, thanks to uh, Maurice Fitzgerald of Mo's Game Table. Uh, unfortunately, Mo couldn't join us tonight to give us some updates. He's uh, he's doing uh, color commentary tonight uh, for American uh, Allen American Hockey uh, Minor Hockey League, so he does that quite often, and he's he's at the hockey game right now broadcasting. So we're gonna miss you, Mo. I think he's gonna check in with us maybe at intermission. So look forward to seeing him in the comments section. Uh, obviously, we had other recent releases, Combat Volume 2, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And here in a moment, Imperial Tide from Gregory M. Smith. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And again, Paper Wars 100 will be coming next. Uh, but we've got Paper Wars issue uh, 99 here. And Paper Wars 100, by the way, does have an expansion uh, for America Bomber. I think it adds about 70 plus counters are going to be included in Paper Wars 100 that goes with the America Bomber expansion. So somebody asked earlier if I want to get a hold of that uh, expansion for America Bomber, would it would it suffice if I just got the magazine only? And the answer to that is uh, no. And no, you do want to get the full game with the magazine because there's 70 uh, plus counters that Greg confirmed for me that go with that expansion that's going to appear in this uh, issue 100 of Paper Wars. And we'll start promoting Paper Wars 100 I uh, hear on the newsletter as well. Compass Games Facebook group is doing great. I know they're at uh, 1600. You can find the page right here. Anybody that has a membership on Facebook, I hope you've joined the Compass Games Enthusiast group. Uh, it's not officially run by Compass at all. It's run by you guys. Uh, and uh, specifically, uh, Mark and David White do a great job with it. So we always want to promote it and mention it during each of our Compass Games live sessions. So definitely something to join. Uh, Maurice Fitzgerald's also working with John Southard, who's going to be doing 
our next learn to play session, which is going to be on the conquistadors. So that's going to be streaming live on Wednesday, February 16th, next Wednesday. And that will be on our uh, Discord channel where we have about 750 plus members on Discord now. So you can watch the live stream. We actually uh, hold it or host it uh, live on the Discord platform. It's quite easy to join and you can get more information about it in our newsletter. So that pretty much wraps up definitely the newsletter. So uh, I do want to just get into a few things before we start with Gilbert, just a few things to mention. And that is, again, just the Constant World News Desk as a reminder uh, for those that want to just find out what the latest videos are, we update in, 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 in basically real time. So you'll see a videos link at the very top in the main, and you'll see this on the community or on the, on the form that Constant World has. But if you click on videos, uh, I'm sort of having fun with it uh, tonight because there's competing unboxing videos for, <laughs> for combat. So we've got Moe's game table right here. Uh, doing combat volume two and then off here to the right i feel like i'm playing uh hollywood squares or something here we are concentration we've got a match we've got another combat volume two by art wolf's lair uh here in the right side in the second row uh, and then of course we've got the video we're doing right now we got our live session tonight and we've got by the way greg emos does a ton a ton of combat play sessions uh, he's got probably over a hundred so just to let you know, it's really easy to get to the videos link. And we have more videos than what you see here. You just want to click on the down arrow, and it will just keep adding more and more videos. So these are all videos, which is amazing. These are all videos just from the last two days. So we've got about 43, 44 of the top content contributors in the hobby. So you're going to see 10 to 15 to 20 updates per day. Um, and again, if I'm missing uh, a personality or a contributor, I'll definitely add them here, any content contributors. But definitely check it out. Uh, it's going to have content from all publishers and cover the hobby in general. So I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, also, we snuck in, again, for Consum World, just to put in a plug, because uh, Gregory Smith, we have Consum World Expo in Dallas coming May 12th through the 15th. So the, the website's gone live. It's going to be in 90 days. Uh, it's based on our Consum World Expo Tempe event which is going to be its 22nd anniversary. And here, right here, we've got Gregory Smith. I'm proud to, very, very excited to announce that Gregory M. Smith will be our guest of honor at Consum World Expo in Dallas, again, May 12th through the 15th. And he'll be hosting a lot of games uh, as well. So you can find out more about Greg here and the games he'll be hosting. But yeah, definitely check out uh, Consum World Expo Dallas. That's sort of our warm-up event to our uh, expo in Tempe which usually gets around 300 people, and that's going to be end of August. So we're really excited about that and looking forward to uh, welcoming Greg and others. A lot of publishers uh, will also be uh, at Consum World Dallas, so we're really excited about it. So without, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, I hope you're going to have some questions for Gilbert. Like We have such a great audience. You always come prepared with many, many questions. You make my life, my job so much easier because all I've got to do is share the comments button because all of you got so many great questions. So I expect no less from you all tonight because we're going to talk about not one, but uh, two games, actually. So let's uh, start here by bringing in uh, Gilbert and saying hi. How are you doing, Gilbert? Hey, John. How's it going? Good. I was worried you might not make it. I heard there might be some truckers in your driveway or in your street not allowing you to get to your house tonight to, uh, yeah. to stream it's live. Siege, huh? siege of Ottawa. I think the truckers have got two siege points on the city right now. I was going to say, I thought you might be working on a new simulation about the Siege of Ottawa or something. Maybe that'll be something uh, that'll show up on a Compass Games pre-order at some point. We'll yeah. have to see how that goes, I guess, right? Fortunately, I'm not in the downtown. I'm actually not bothered by it, but they are paralyzing the city. They're making the news. so uh, They're definitely making worldwide news. That's right. So just uh, you know, stay safe and I uh, hope everything works out in the end. And uh, again, it's a pleasure. I think it's since November of 2020. When we yeah. had you on last, we talked about War for America. We were introducing the game to many people. Yeah, just, I think we just announced the pre-order that night, actually. Yeah. And, of course, we've gone full circle now, and uh, we're getting very close to the release of, of your game. So, But before we get to that, let's uh, for those that haven't had a chance to, uh, perhaps they didn't meet you in our November broadcast, could you share with everybody just a little bit about your background, what you've been up to lately, and then we'll get into the specifics of your two games. Okay, well... Uh... I started with the old Avenal Hill games in 1969, you know, Midway and Waterloo and all that. Graduated to this SPI games in the 70s and 
more recently, the Compass Games. Uh, I've been playing a lot of U.S. Civil War uh, from Mark Simonich. Yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. the last year or two is War for America has been occupying a lot of my time. More recently, my recent project, which you're going to announce later. And uh, keeping busy. Right now, um, I'm negotiating a move. I'm moving to the west end of the city, so that's keeping me oh. busy. But, uh, oh, that is. I bet that, yeah, I know moves can... I know Kev Sharp's going through a big move himself with, with construction as an added bonus. So, oh, great. Uh, that's Thank always you. a major life. They say that's one of those major life uh, occurrences yeah. when you when you go through something like that. Yeah, and when and you move, see your, if, game, yeah. When you move yeah. your game collection, you go, oh, my God, I still have that game. Oh my, and you, you find the map, <laughs> and you, but you don't have the game. You've got the map and not the game. Well, exactly exactly yeah. all right well that was where well, you just want to do a cursory introduction yeah. so i think i think that will suffice because i really uh want to obviously get to this little guy right here so mm -hmm. i want to revisit uh war for america of course everybody knows it's on our website um uh but uh shame on me there's some graphics and files that i should be adding uh to the website i'll give everybody sort of a sneak peek tonight because i notice we don't have any counters on there etc so there's uh, or the back of the box so i'm going to be obviously uh, solving that but uh, in the meantime uh let's let's give a high level just let's reintroduce the game to everybody again it's going to be shipping probably within a month uh it's coming up very soon that's why i want to have you on tonight actually but if you can give everybody just like what level the game is just sort of the elevator pitch on your on your design okay well um hmm. my first american revolution game was called american revolution 1972 by jim donegan I later got the Avalon Hill 1776. And I've been buying strategic games on the revolution now for years. And I've liked some, disliked others. And I said, well, it's time for me to take a crack at it. And uh, War for America is the result. It's the entire war. So it's grand, grand strategy. It's point to point movement, much like my Mr. Madison War uh, game was. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's got new concepts, of course, catered to the revolution. Um. It's a long game, though. It's a big one. It's some people said it, it's almost like uh, Simonich's Civil War only it's the Revolution. Uh -huh. That's sort of. And I know, true. I know, this game War for America has two maps, which is yes, you know nice two maps. It's, it's two a, paper maps. I'll yeah. show the maps again, even though they're on the website. I'll show them again here in a yeah. moment. Big yeah. game. Uh, I mean, to finish a game, uh, eighteen hours, but the game can end early if you get the knockout blow. So. Um, there's also two scenarios. You don't have to play the whole war. You can start the war in 1778. That'll cut your playing time in half. Right. Basically a two player, but also it could be played solitaire as well. I know Bill, Bill's actually been playing the game solitaire. Uh, as you know, he has his basement and he's got all his multiple tables, ping pong tables spread across his yeah. house. And, uh, he's been uh, enjoying the game solitaire for, for some time now. So, uh, he always goes through every game. Uh, before it goes out but uh, yeah no definitely want to mention that but yeah it's a two-player game uh, obviously by design but yeah you can definitely get by uh, playing it solitaire i so. played it solitaire several times i like a solitaire so yeah you can be played solitaire yeah and there's the two maps which uh, as you can see they're sort of landscape mode stacked on top of each other beautiful beautiful maps i know we've you know when we we did introduce the maps i believe previously and people really really like the maps what i unfortunately did not have handy and it's not uh on the website yet and I'll zoom in here so everybody can see it a little bit better, is we uh, do have the back of the box here. So again, uh, you've already given the introduction to the game already, Gilbert. If you want to do a voiceover here while I show the back of the box, that's sure. fine. But basically, yeah, it's strategic level for the war for America, what it's showing from the British perspective. Maybe we'll have you talk a little bit more. Uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about what you mean by British perspective and maybe rewind, remind folks some of the research you've done in your own life uh, around this historical period, I know you're a big fan, or you know, really, you really study the period. I should say you're you're really a researcher, professional on the period. So maybe if you could, um, and again, I want to give everybody a chance to see this. Here's the bottom section of the box. So it gives you a quick rundown. Uh, again, two maps, three counter sheets. I will show counters tonight, by the way. So again, apologies, that's not on the website, but uh, as you can see, we'll we'll provide that tonight to everybody that's kind enough to join our broadcast tonight. But uh, could you share a little bit more just about what you mean what you mean by the British perspective and also share a little bit about your historical research background with this era? Well, uh, okay, most of you know I'm a resident of Canada, Ottawa, the nation's capital. There's no revolutionary history here. There's no military history in Ottawa because it was off the beaten path. But I went down to Saratoga in 1969 
fell in love with the battlefield. I went down there in the fall when the leaves were changing. At the exact same time, Burgoyne's army marched through there. And I've had a love of Saratoga campaign and the revolution since then. Uh, I've been reading about it for decades. And um, so the research is certainly there. I've played all of the other strategic games, um, liked some, disliked others. So I try to make a best of, take all the best features mm -hmm. I liked of American Revolution, the best yep. features in 1776, uh, Washington's War, and come up with my own thing on it. Um, British perspective. Well, it is because I was heavily influenced by the game or the, the book War for America by Piers Maxey. He's an Englishman. And of course, it's the revolution very much from his point of view. And um, as I read more and more about the revolution, I see how almost hopeless it was for the British to win. So that's why it sort of is a good solitaire game. I, I, but the British can win, but if they're, go they're going to win, they're going to have to win early in the war because once it drags out and the French get in, it's a whole different game. I saw one guy asking, what is the difference between the first half and the second half? Well, the second half, once the French get in and they've got fleets, both sides sort of fight it in the Caribbean. Oh, the the yeah. British aren't going to conquer the 13 colonies after 1778. It's just not going to happen. Okay. So it's almost like two games. Yep, yep. And then let me do this for everybody who hasn't seen this yet. I want to share for everybody the uh, counters. And if I zoom in, you'll see the quality. It's a, it's a PDF. So if I zoom in, you can get an idea of the quality of the counters. Uh, this is by Newt Grunitz, who does a lot of great work. He has a real good periodic feel to his artwork. Oh, I, I know that's I why love the you know, I, I enjoy working with Newt. He really does the historical feel. So I'll go back to a smaller size quality. Might not be as good here to see, but I want to give everybody a chance to see them. But here's the front side of... Uh, uh, obviously, uh, you have the counters on the left and the right for the, uh, you know, the different uh, regions, and then this, that's the back side. And here's here's uh, the, yeah, here's the other uh, forces here on sheet two, um, and then the backs, and then we have some special larger size counters as well. Maybe you can explain these. I believe these are the naval counters. Yeah, and naval counters some, are, yeah, physically larger. Yeah, and then the bottom counters here again remind me what these uh, the non-naval. Uh, the what the Lake Navy ones there? Yeah, the ones in the bottom. Oh, here those, are the, those are the army counters. Army, army counters, right? Right. So much like Mark Simonich's, instead of having a big stack of counters, set the counters aside on the army cards, and then you can move around just an army, which is solves counter clutter problems. Yeah, we got some embarked markers here, some game status. Here's militia. Got the Continentals on the right for everybody to see. There is that the combat value, the troop strength. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you'll probably notice that I've chose on purpose the same colors that Avalon Hill did for 1776. Ah, interesting. That, that green okay. militia and the blue continentals have a powerful effect on me. So I said, I'm going to use the same colors. And remind us all what that leadership uh, value is. Uh, there's looks like we have plus ones, plus yeah, those, twos. All, those are all tactical sorts. leaders, tactical. They, they will command units of only one or one, and uh, they will add to the uh, die roll. They, okay. they will. They'll be on the board, but they more affect battles. Okay, great. Okay, well, I'm glad we could. I, I want to make sure we were able to show the uh, counters for the game because, again, we didn't have the counters or the back of the box. I'll be sure uh, to add those uh, here shortly. But let's go to some questions. We've got, sure. as as promised and as expected, we've, uh, we've got, well, first of all, Brian's calling you Mr. War of 1812. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Um, but we have one question from David Myler. Thanks for joining us on YouTube, David, tonight. So it's a strategic scale game, of course, as he knows. But does Butler's Rangers make an appearance in any form or manner? Yes, he does. Now, I, I liked SPI's uh, revolution back in 72, but there was no leaders. And I don't know, the you've got to have leaders in a revolution game, the personalities. And I wanted to get the lower leaders too. So yes, there is a butler counter. He can only uh, command like a one or a two, but he can make a difference. So he's in. Yeah, so he's in there. Okay. And then you did answer the question from Shin Godzilla that you saw about the second half of the war with the yeah. Fran French and the conflict. So oh, you've yeah. covered that, the Caribbean. We've talked about that. Let's go to John's question. Hey, John, by the way, I got my haircut since you told me I needed a haircut. So I just did that. Today. Hey, John, so I know John. Just, yeah. did, just did it for him today. Just just for him. So there you go. So yeah. he wants to uh, says, uh, how how is War for America different, just specifically to Avalon Hill 1776, uh, just between those two? Well, it's quite different because mine's point to point. 1776 is hexagrid. And this War for America has had a heck of a, 
an evolution. I started with an area movement game, then went point to point, then back to area again, converted it to hexagon, and then finally went back to point to point. So I was wrestling with what you're vacillating there. Which yeah. is the best? So what is which is the best from all the games? You had to still have well, to figure that out a little I, I bit. I think mine should be in there for a good simulation. Uh, okay. what, Washington's War. Yes, I, I play Washington's War. It's a very popular at WBC, but but it's it's not the revolution. It's it's a a go game with a revolution theme. Oh, that's and a good way I to put it. it. I yeah. wanted something a bit more. Okay, let's uh, do this. I, I know we we touched upon this a little bit before but maybe can you give us just sort of a capsule review of how combat, combat mechanics work in the game if there's any key modifiers or leadership yeah. tactical things like that that have an yeah. impact well like most games of course combat will be when you're on the same square and depending on the square there might not be combat at all if you're on a small little wee square in a wilderness combat is compulsory if you're on a larger square like a city uh combat is optional Mechanics, uh, yeah, modifiers for the leaders and troop quality is important. Uh, you mentioned are... also that it's just not one of these games where you have a combat and the unit's eliminated. You're doing something with yeah. step reduction, the wearing down of units. Yeah, right? that got me. Every single, and I'm, they're all, everyone had this flaw. Everyone has like a World War One or World War Two combat table. You're all die, DE, they're gone. A the whole army's just gone. That didn't happen in the entire revolution. So I decided to make the casualties more realistic. And I used Mark Simonich's just Civil War as a, as, a, as a guide. So in this game, when you get into a big, big battle, maybe you inflict two on the guy and he'll inflict on one. But yep. you've won the battle and you've driven, driven him off. So you're not going to see the huge casualties of the Civil War and the Napoleonic Wars. They didn't have them. Uh, I'll get, just give you an example. Battle of Saratoga, I think the British had about 600 killed, wounded, and missing. Mm -hmm. That's less than one strength point. Oh, and, your, that's right, because you're a thousand, you're doing yeah, a thousand, thousand, thousand per strength point, right? Yeah, the Mon with the biggest battle of the war, they got lost about the equivalent of a strength point. So, <laughs> that's the wearing down. So that's why we're not going to see. Yeah. Uh, which, which I, you know what? I've seen some comments recently. People have talked about some games. Doesn't matter what the era is. And they seem to have the belief. I guess it depends on scale, too, of course. But they're right. like, you know what? We like games that show the wearing down, sort yeah. of the attritional effect of, uh, Combat right. over time versus one and done all the right. time. Now, but, you somebody, know, I know there can be exceptions. Depending yeah, on now scale. somebody can counter. Well, wait a minute, Gilbert. What about Saratoga, Yorktown, and Charleston? Well, okay, that's my point. Those armies surrendered. And in my game, you you can get surrounded and you have to surrender. That's how those armies get knocked out. Oh, all right, good. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, John has another follow-up question about uh, Native Americans. Do they play a significant role? Yeah. In everybody game. asked that, and everybody's tried to get the Native Americans in. Uh, they weren't in American Revolution by uh, Jim Dunnigan. They were in 1776. Mm -hmm. And we had a joke back in 75, and it was, the year the Indians move is the year the Indians die. Because there oh. were three ones, and they always died. Oh, boy. Yeah, in the game, well, in the game, right? The game. Yeah, that's just, no. it, Yes, they are in my game. They are in the background. But right card comes up, right play. The guy leaves the supply line open or something. They can do some damage. Yes, they are in. And we have a named leader, Joseph Brandt. He's well known in Ontario because he's the founder. Or our city of Brantford is named after him. That's worth mentioning. The nice thing about having cards in a game system like you have cards is it's probably easier to, to insert some of this historical detail. It is. Like what some folks are asking about. I know some of this is probably covered somewhat with card play. That there might yeah. be a card representing an individual or an yes. effect or a involvement of, of some yeah. sort. And, and to, to clarify, it is not a card-driven game, right. Mr. Madison's War. It is card-assisted, yes. like Mark Simonich's Civil War. Perfect, perfect. Uh, Brian, I'll try to do my best job here. I haven't done any mem um, measurement of the two maps because I don't have them physically. Obviously, it's landscape mode, so you're going to know the width is 34 inches. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be 44 by 34 because that means there's like zero gap. There is going to be some overlap. Think, so I'm going to guess it's probably 43, 43 yeah, by 34 or something. It like. overlaps by a half inch. It, it, it fits together okay. beautifully. Yeah. So, so it's going to be a little less. So it's going to be like 44 by... Uh, 34. 34 we'll call yeah. it 43 and a half by 34 for right. brian and we'll, we'll leave it there darren's asking uh in petaluma darren's in petaluma nice area i have friends there uh does it include gibraltar and the west indies if it 
does have this British focus. The West Indies for sure, because the British have interests there. In my original game, Gibraltar was there, but it didn't do much. So it was one of the casualties. You just had to go off the board. So no, Gibraltar is not there, but the West Indies is. I got you. Uh, Eric's uh, just two miles from the battlefield. That's pretty oh, cool. Oh, cool. Eric, what, t- what town? What town, what? Eric? Eric, you're going to have to type in what town you're in there. See which one within two miles. Let us know. David thought he noticed the Brandt counter as well as Anida unit. Yes. Uh, on, uh, Brandt is the only Indian leader in the game, and he's pro-British. He, uh, the Indians can join either side in my game. You're going to roll a die, oh. and there's a chance the Indians can go into the American side because some Indian tribes did join the colonists. Great. And then Jason's a member of the Gilbert Collins Book Club. Yeah, he's read your War for America, which you suggested, and the video based on the video recommendation as well. well so I'm going to challenge you. you. I'm, this is unrehearsed. I'm going to challenge you here a little yeah. bit, Gilbert, because you have read a lot. For somebody like Jason who's done this already, what would you recommend to him next, and why? Something to read, something to watch. What uh, What would be a good compliment to what he's done here? It depends. If you want the whole war, you can't go better with War for America by Piers Maxey. But there's a new one come out by. Rick somebody, Rick Atkinson, maybe? Oh, Rick Atkinson, right. Yeah, right, I right. bought the first one and love it. So it was quite good. Okay, there we go. Very good. Yeah. And then uh, Jack mentions West Indies. I think he saw it on the bottom yeah. of the map. So, okay. Um, and then uh, AJ's thinking it's tough to solve that counterinsurgency problem in the system. Yeah, I never quite got that. I know that like when Liberty came out, which is part of the coin series, I saw it at WBC and just fell in love with it. I said, oh, my <laughs> God, that map, that map, beautiful. But I'm sorry to say the coin series is just not for me. I can't move those little blocks around, and it doesn't have enough period feel for me. But I know that there's fans of it. Oh, I'm yeah, just- I'm old school. I, I I wish I could be a fan, but I'm so old school with hexagons. Yeah, I, me too. I, I'm, I'm, help- I'm helpless. I, I'm- yeah. Uh, David noticed, you know, a lot of people paying really close attention to the graphics. I should have probably spent a little bit more time on the graphics tonight. So maybe I'll go slower when we get to the next project we talk yeah, about. Butler, Butler, Butler's a bad guy to you guys. You don't like Butler. America is <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to see a three hour epic movie on, on Walter Butler. That's for sure. You know? Yeah. Alan, Alan's joining us on YouTube. Thanks, Alan. He's wondering how scripted the game is from a historical perspective with this question about uh, how the French come in, et cetera. I see yeah. maybe some, I don't know if the cards have anything to do with that or not. So, Well, I, I, I discussed that in the, in the designer's notes. I keep going back to Dunnigan. Now, in Dunnigan's game, the French only came in when a major British army surrendered. Then the French would come in the next spring. In Randy Reed's design, Avalon Hill, 1776, uh, they were coming in no matter what, uh, but they were coming in in around 1778. So I wanted to marry the two. I've, I've kind of got both in mind. Uh, they're coming in probably by 1778. But if you pull a Saratoga off early, they're going to come in earlier. Gotcha. So it's the best of both. Gotcha. And uh, boy, everybody's really wants you to, uh, a lot of great questions tonight. So thanks, everybody. Uh, Charles is asking, how is the French intervention handled in terms yeah. of gameplay? That's pretty yeah. well the way I've explained it. In 1778, you're going to roll a die. And as each season goes by, there's a more chance they're going to come in. But if you've pulled a Saratoga victory, uh, let's say in 1777, they're coming in in the spring of 78. All right. And Thomas mentions that in 1776, there were no leader uh, leaders in the I game. Know. But, but yeah. uh, David thinks there was a general issue that did yes. add variant leaders. So there was. was that... I did play it, yeah. Okay. Did you incorporate? What did you incorporate as far as? I know you took the best of everything. So what, would you, what did you learn from your e- effort on uh, Mr. Madison's war towards this design? Well, when I meet people at WBC, they knew I was working on a revolution game and they sort of told me what they wanted. They said, look, we want a revolution game. We want it just to be exactly like Mr. Madison's war. And I said, well, it can't really be because the War of 1812 was so different Uh, because the armies are huge in the revolution. You know, at at Monmouth, there's what? Well, at New York, there's like 22,000 Americans at that battle. And the largest British army that had ever sailed in North America landed in New York. So they're huge armies. So I couldn't use the same system as Mr. Madison's war, but I tried to get as much of it as I could, you know? Gotcha. Yep, yeah. Yeah. And Darren asked a question. I can't remember this myself. Sorry. Uh, my mind's moved on to so many other projects in my head right now. Any one map scenarios? I can't remember if we talked about a way to split the map uh, to actually to do that. In theory, no, I didn't design it, but yeah, if you're, if you're playing that. the first year of the war, just, don't put the southern map on. You're, you're not going to go south. First year of the war, you're not going to go that far south, right? No, 
but exactly. uh, you, you could, but I didn't design it that way. Okay. So, uh, oh, nice, yeah. tag, nice tagline on YouTube. My own worst enemy. I, I can yeah. relate sometimes to that. So I'm right there with you, buddy. Uh, uh, are there random, any uh, so-called random events? Oh yeah. That's, that's the cards, eh? Yeah. That's yeah, the cards. Exactly. So yeah. uh, the guy pulls, uh, I don't know, Lord North gives a great speech and everything in favor of the Americans and the British political will goes down one notch and you go, eh, one notch, who cares? Yeah, yep. it goes to zero, you lose the game. So it, they can make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Fast Heinz is going to level you up here with this answer. He's, he's interested to hear about how you switch between area movement and point to point. Is there any influence from Against the Odds magazine titles here? Have you uh, had exposure to Tarleton's quarters? Almost a miracle at all. What's, got, what's your. I've got what's... both those games. Well, I brought the prototype down, would be what, 2017 or so, down to WBC, showed it off. Everybody liked it. They all had suggestions. And then I brought it home and said, nah, I can't get into war area <laughs> movement. It's that same old problem. you got two guys in an area. Where are you really? Are you on the coast of that lake? Are you in a fortification? You're somewhere in that area, and it always causes problems. So I, I chucked it. And yet Tarleton's Quarter and Almost a Miracle are very good games. Yep, yep. Very oh, great. Glad that. Okay, you leveled up based on yep. Fast Science's question. And then uh, – Dan, don't worry, you didn't come in too late, and this is recorded as well, so no worries there. And yeah, your, your wait's not going to be much longer, uh, Dan, so it'll probably be less than a month, just to yeah. let you know. Also, for uh, Tim over on YouTube channel, uh, yeah, uh, Gilbert's been playing his own game right here, yeah. Solitaire, and Bill Thomas at Compass has been playing the game Solitaire fine, so yeah, definitely it's, can... Yeah, it's, it's tough as a British, so yeah. I kind of take that British point of view, so it works Solitaire fine. Okay, uh, Shin's not going to give the cards away here. He's not going to tell you what he's talking about here, about the issues the colonies experience, keeping an army in the field, supply, whatever, cohesion, yeah. all that fun stuff. I'll let, you, I'll let you run with that, whatever direction you want to go with that, yeah. what you think that means. I got and, that uh, in. And then yeah. the recruiting piece. In 1775, of course, all the counters are green. They're all militia. There is no such thing as a Continental Army. The Continental Army, in theory, on paper, is created in, what, July of 1775. Washington takes command about that time. And so on paper, yeah, there's a Continental Army. It's called a Continental Army, but it's all militia. So they get better. And later on in the war, when the French come in and war weariness is in, the colonists are bankrupt, you're having a hard time to create a Continental Army. Let's face it, they had two mutinies in, what, 1780 or so. So um, preserve your Continental Army if you can, but it gets tougher as the war drags on too, even for the Americans. Right. Okay. We're going to get a little more specific now with your game, a little more specific. Uh, yeah. Cards are a nice way. Just David saying good thumbs up. Uh, Justin says, is this a pure military game or is there an intent uh, to show, to model the influence on the political side via vis-a-vis -vis parliament, for example? Good question. Uh, I wrestled with that one because almost every American revolution game is completely ignored the political except for one. And it was a darn good game. It was Joe Miranda's game uh, decision in North America. It was a magazine game and it heavily had the politics in it. Mm -hmm. Gee, the military suffered though, but it, I liked where it was going. So to answer your question, I've got political events, but they're cards, and they're not yeah. big, big game changers. Yeah, yeah, the, the cards help uh, bring that flavor into the game. And related to cards, since you're talking about cards, so good timing for this question. How are the cards handled in the game? Is it a hand? Do you flip for events, such as as done in Liberty or Death? How how, how would you uh, characterize? Oh, it's it's like hand? Civil War. I I unashamedly. Um, state that I borrowed from Mark Simonich there. You get uh, three cards per year and you use them when you want to use them. Got it. Got so, it. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know how liberty or death works. AJ, let us know how you do. You want to look for, you don't need 44 inches exactly. No. It might be nice, but you definitely need 34 inches width. Yeah. So you want to get close to 44 by 34. So let us know, AJ, how that works out for you. Let's see what we got here. What game mechanics do spaces outside of 13 colonies play in the game see we're getting very specific i yeah. should probably switch over to the rules at some point i do have the rules by the way sure. the rules are here uh if the link's on the website it was from the u it was from our uh it's going to be uh the reason i have it here is because I, I should mention this now so this is sort of breaking news is uh and everybody will be excited to hear this because we have our kickstarter which will most likely kick in next week 
And you know what that means. When a Kickstarter happens, that means the game is about ready to go out the door. So, so we've got this staged already. So the rules uh, for your game are right here. Um, I could, you know, we could zoom in or talk about the rules a little bit if we want. But again, this will be available on our Kickstarter page in a few days for everybody. But yeah, game mechanics. So back to the question, uh, Brian's asking about uh, game yeah. mechanics for spaces outside the 13 column. Yeah, I'm looking through the manual right now. There's no pictures of the spaces outside, but there's virtually only one space and it's a little wee map of Europe. It's more or less a place where the British come from. Now, another thing that a lot of the revolution games get wrong is they seem to have this idea that a continual flow of British reinforcements just kept going to America. They just arrived on boat every day and uh, the British army got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, that's not the case. And Piers Maxi gets into that. It's almost like the Japanese in World War II. They've got this magnificent high seas fleet. It's great. It's one of the best fleets in the world, but it's irreplaceable. As ships are sunk, you'll never get them back. The British regulars in the game are gold. You don't want to lose them if you don't have to. And uh, you get very few reinforcements. In fact, the reinforcements the British did send to America were only replacing units that were lost or mustered out. So the British Army stayed about the same for the whole war. Oh, gotcha. In 70, I made a chart and it peaked in, I think, the winter of 78, and then it just goes down. Gotcha. So you, well, yeah. A uh, good recommendation about Atkinson's book. So a few people here talking about they've read it already as well. They're waiting for the next follow-up book. Me too. So, uh, yeah. So yeah, he's done some uh, amazing work in his field. That's for sure. Uh, let's see uh, what other questions I can find here. Let me just take a quick poll before we get into the next project, because we probably have to start doing that pretty soon. Uh, what about the issues, the colonies experience keeping an, uh, oh no, I, I covered that already. I think we've just covered that. So oh, I didn't mention recruiting uh, militia. Yeah, rec okay. Regulars is a, is a chart. Uh, you're going to roll on a chart. You can get a low amount of regulars, a medium or high, because it's not fair if you know every turn I'm getting four, 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 four. You can't always know what regulars you're going to get. And as the British occupy or eat up more of the 13 colonies, you're going to get less regulars, of course. Uh, how did you rate uh, Gates and Lee in the game for leadership quality? I think I there's C class, I think. Uh, they add at least one to the dice. Okay, A, you're adding two to the dice. B, you're adding, no, it's got to be A is adding two, B adding one, C adding, uh, no, A, A two, uh -huh. B one, yeah. C, I think zero. Yeah. And then D, I don't think there is any D, a D. That's the way it generally goes. Yeah, it? yeah, got you. Is there a Lafayette counter, uh, Jason's asking? Um, you know what? Um, I can't remember. Car? Maybe it's, it's a card? Should, should be. Yeah, I, probably. Uh, I can't remember, to tell you the truth. Okay. Well, we'll find out. Or it might be a card or something that handles it. How about Benedict Arnold? Oh, of course, yeah. He's yeah. a he's the only two-sided counter in the game. One side. <laughs> two-sided yeah. counter in the yeah. game. <laughs> and one side, one side's British. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I get what you're saying there. He's a, <laughs> a, and he's a very good American leader. So you want to use the... You want to use yeah, him David as much says as you wasn't can. A traitor to him, so there you go. Before goes. he turns, yeah. <laughs> I've got some agreement on that one. All right, awesome. Okay, well, thanks to everybody uh, for the questions. I thought what we should probably do now is uh, switch gears a little bit because I, I do want to uh, introduce everybody uh, to a game that you've been working on uh, for the past year plus, longer. I know you've had YouTube videos longer than that on the Kaiser's High Seas Fleet. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to switch gears. Thanks to everybody for your interest in War for America. We're definitely excited to get it out soon. Kickstarter, look for the Kickstarter next week. Uh, Kaiser's High Seas Fleet is not yet on pre-order from Compass. So people since the YouTube announcement have been asking me, where is the pre-order page? I want to pre-order Kaiser's High Seas Fleet right now. Yeah. <laughs> and sorry, it's not. we're not quite there yet, uh, but we're going to give you a nice introductory preview uh, to Kaiser's High Seas Fleet. So uh, with that in mind, I'll just share here quickly. Uh, actually, I want to go to the, I got to find the front of the box. I'm not sure what I, I'll have to find that. But I'll, yeah. I'll, in the meantime, I can focus on the, on the, let's go at the back of the box and you can give the elevator pitch on this, which I know has something very similar to War at Sea from John Edwards as an influence. Yeah, in the designer notes, I say square quite specifically that this is a derivative of John's game, War at Sea. I did not invent War at Sea. It was done uh, 
when John the the eighties or the seventies? Uh, seventies, most like seventy five when there Warren C was first published by Jetco, I believe. Yeah, and I think it's been republished close to five or six times, so it's oh, very yeah. successful. Keeps on I, going, and we've got Victory at Sea coming, which is another yes. uh, offshoot of yeah. War at Sea from John Edwards, and that's going to be out this year. Yeah. So so yeah, so the elevator. That's a really good elevator pitch. I think just saying that people know. Oh, okay. It's, yeah. it's adapting that system. So it's, yeah. this is not going to be campaign for North Africa from SPI covering World War One naval, right? It's going to be. A, it's a it's the whole war covers uh, the Mediterranean too, uh, the Black Sea. Um, I had to tweak it, of course, for World War One, because I, I'll give you a guilty confession. I said it in the designer's notes. I was not a great fan of War at Sea. I didn't uh -huh. even know the game. I went to WBC one year. There was a big tournament going on. And the fellow says, you're joining War at Sea? And I said, no, I don't even know how to play it. He said, here, I'll show you. Oh, okay. So he showed me how to play it. All right. So I joined the tournament. Of course, got wiped out on, <laughs> on <laughs> round one. Which um, happens quickly, I'm sure. Which happens quickly. And I said, you know, this game would be good for World War I. Why has nobody done a game on World War I? Um, because, frankly, World War II at sea... What chance did the Germans have? They got a couple of surface raiders like Tirpitz and Bert and Bismarck and stuff. The British have got a fleet. Yeah. So I never thought World War II is best uh, for that system. So this is, the Germans have a chance. And this has, uh, to answer that question, uh, somebody was wondering uh, if it's a point to point or area. And, and Andrew, you can see here, uh, we've got some areas here that's, uh, in that's the game, area. similar. So. Uh, and also a question from Shin about, is it like Grand Fleet from L2 Design Group? Is it similar to that in style, which I well, believe is also an offshoot of a little I, bit. I had Steve's Grand Fleet. I bought it and there was just so many counters and I I couldn't get into it. I just couldn't. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm going to blow my own horn here, but I took the combat system and tweaked it. I think people that liked War at Sea will like the combat system better in this game, and you can even retrofit it to War at Sea. If you like my combat system better, you can plug it right into War. That's what I was going to ask you next: is what gave you the motivation to do this using War at Sea? And 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 you did change things up. So yeah. So being unabashedly, don't be unabashedly shy about this. So how do you feel you're 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 making advancements? With okay. that system from '76, how how you you think yours is better? Which, as you said, can retrofit. Yeah, your your system could retrofit to those sure. that own War at Sea. Well, the War at Sea would bothered me when the guy was teaching it to me. Just okay, we rolled dice. I got it. Yeah, I got a six. Well, I've seen that before. Oh, those four ships are sunk. I said sunk. Yeah, dead sunk. Uh, okay, so I thought, how am I going to do Jutland with 37 German ships and what? Now, 27 uh, Germans and 37 British in a big, big battle. You roll dice and like 10 or sh 10 ships sink. That doesn't make any sen sense. At Jutland, I think only three or four capital ships were lost. So I decided to make a break off thing where you hit the guy. He takes so much damage. He's got to break off. He tries to escape. He lays smoke and, and escapes. So you're not going to get huge, huge fleets sinking in this game. You'll be forced to break off. And it's far more realistic. Yeah, yeah, and as everybody can see here, this is going to be a mounted single map game. It's going to have a mounted map. This is not the final map. You'll see the little uh, red X for no U-boats. Yeah. That's actually a proofing. Uh, it, it's been updated. I just don't have the latest map, but you know we proof the maps, and and you went through this, and that that piece is getting removed. But just I think this gives a good flavor. Again, it's Newt Grunitz again. You know, you've teamed up again with Newt to, for the artwork. So I think that periodic flavor is is shining through here. And this this is obviously a later draft. Of a map which has since you know been updated already again but it'll be a very nice uh mounted map and maybe what I, we could do is we can switch over uh, to the counters sure um just to give people a, a sort of a flavor for that so uh, i'll let you walk uh, talk through sure. uh you know they probably know what some of these values mean already but i'll let you go ahead and uh, yeah. explain you got some numeric uh, circular values as well yeah okay upper left look at the invincible battle cruiser you see the first digit is uh, two that's the attack factor he'll be rolling two dice the middle factor is what I call the protection factor, or defense factor, and the BC indicates it's a battle cruiser. Now, where is my system different? Well, in War at Sea, if you rolled two dice and got sixes, the invincible would instantly sink. Um, in my game, it's a little bit, there's some gradation. Look at Lion, which is, uh, well, 
well, go look at Renat. No, Vanguard, fourth, fourth one over. See, it's a 3-3. Three, three. It's a little bit harder to, to sink. So, for yeah. example, if you've got two hits on the Vanguard, which is one less than its protection value, you put a break-off counter on it, and it must break off from the battle. So you have a chance to get away. And, yes, there is pursuit fire with limits. So okay. it's just better gradation of, of, of sinking. Also shows you how thin skinned the battle cruisers really are. Um, defensive two, boy, you can't stay in the battle line too long. And remind me if you cover this already, where the uh, blue highlight is, what's that circular value? That's in the, the turn they come in. The turn That's they... the turn they come in. Got yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Makes, makes, makes perfect sense. And there. also I didn't like in Wartz is you, you took like 20 counters and just made a big fleet. It was just an anonymous 20 counter fleet. <laughs> You'll see on mine, it says 4th Squadron, 5th Squadron, 2nd Squadron. That mm, makes yep. a difference. Ships yep. were attached to, to squadrons for reasons. So, my so you're not going to let it, they're not going to let them pile up to no. some ungodly stack, like a that's, Europa stack or a that's right. Objective Moscow stack from SPI. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. the backs, this is not for hidden movement or anything. You just wanted to have the nationality on the back of the yeah. counter. Yeah. Not meant to be a hidden, not meant to be a hidden force or any, anything like that on the back, counter backs. Yeah, the pre-dreadnoughts, uh, I got a lot of feedback from people saying, you've got to have the pre-dreadnoughts. You've got to have them. Steve uh, had them in his game, and, well, they were like one-hit wonders. They just you got hit and sunk, hit and sunk, hit and sunk. And there was tons of counters. The counter clutter was awful. And everybody who's tried to put the pre-dreadnoughts in has had the same problem. I said, okay, I'll compromise. I'll put the pre-dreadnoughts in, but they will be one counter, one oh, or two. to one show two that that's it. They have okay. a capability, but guys, they're one-hit wonders. Um, what's what's the uh, dice uh, and what's the uh, significance of uh, switching to dice here? This is the U-boats, yeah, obviously. U so that has to do with the U-boat system in yeah, the game. But I noticed you have that. Yes, as we know that after Jutland, uh, 1916, the strategy of the Germans changed considerably. They changed to U-boat warfare, and U-boats in this game, you'll roll two dice, roll on a special merchant shipping table. And you're going to get straight points depending on whether you sink merchant shipping or not. You say, well, isn't that a little bit luck oriented? Uh, yeah, of course it is. It's a simple game. But as the, well, the depth charge wasn't even invented till I think 1917, the countermeasures were very primitive. But once the allies get their countermeasures in place, the effectiveness of the U-boats begins to drop off. All right, Bill, we'll take, uh, we're just updating, doing drafts here. So I'll, uh, I'll make a note if there's a spelling error. We'll uh, we'll take advantage of your uh, good eyes there, and we'll we'll get that fixed. So thanks for that. That oh, I didn't see. Like, where is it? I see the bottom. Uh, right. We'll find it. Yeah, it's probably yeah. somewhere in the counter uh, yeah, sheet, probably, but not a problem. Uh, let's see here. Um, so let's see what else we have for counters here. We have a few more here. There's the room forty rule. Can you explain mm -hmm. to everybody what the room maybe room, room 40. Uh, forty rule is all about? There's a special rule for yeah, that. Yeah, everybody game. knows room forty from World War Two. The famous, uh, you know breaking the enigma code uh breaking the code in world war one was very important too and the british did crack it so once in the game well i'm going to explain the how you find each other remember in war at sea you were both in the same area you fought that's all there was mm -hmm. and i go geez they're like 200 square miles of ocean and they just they have to fight they might not have even seen each other. So, <laughs> yeah, the scale my, might be. Yeah. yeah. Simplification, simplification, yes. as they say, right? <laughs> I, I understood that. So <laughs> I had, there's a little bit of a search procedure, but let's say once in the game, you're the British and you've got your whole fleet. You've captured the Germans. You, I got them. I got you guys. I don't want to roll the dice and not see them. Well, room 40 is the rescue. You can use this chit mm -hmm. once in the game. And oh. you sighted them and caught them, you see. Oh, so the sure thing. There you go. Yeah. Good to know. Good to know. And we got some uh, hit markers here, control markers. Well, we got a lot here. Break off. Yeah. Uh, sunk, hits, fire. Newt did a beautiful job on those hit counters. Yeah, I really yeah, like he the did. Those, that definitely shows something going on. That's definitely uh, evocative of uh, yeah. some bad things happening, right? Everybody asks me what the, the fire counters. They say, what the devil are they in for? Uh -huh. So I'll tell you why. When you've got... 26 ships all in a row and you're shooting at each other one by one. You get down to what the 10th ship and you're talking with your opponent and you go, where were we in the line? <laughs> where were we in the line? I, I don't know. Who's next? <laughs> you, you take the fire marker and move it down the line as you fire. 
<laughs> uh, it's never happened. Uh, you never have it. We'll, we'll remove those markers. Nobody yeah. will admit to that. All right. And then we got the German equivalent, Feuer. I like that. Off to the right here, right? Yes. You got uh, a nice little uh, linguistic. Words. Yeah. Love, love that. And then I think we have some bigger size circular. Yeah. Let's uh, take a moment to explain these larger circular markers and yeah. how they're used in the game. That's to, to cut down on counter clutter like a lot of games have. So you've got the British fleet with 37 vessels. I mean, a stack of 37 vessels is, is insane. So I broke them down into squadrons. You, you would take those ships, put them on your little squadron chart, and then you can move one or two counters on the game. And these will be physically larger. I think they're five-eighths inch, maybe even an inch, and they're much easier. And at the request of some of my American friends, they said, you've got to get the sixth squadron in there. And I said, well, the American ships were kind of, you know, haphazard. No, no, you got to call it the sixth squadron. And I said, oh, sure, and we'll call it the sixth squadron. So there it is. <laughs> All right, we're going to have more questions, but I do want to show a little bit more. Uh, just as an FYI, we have a draft of the rules, everybody. Um, I, I, I know it's going to be hard to sort of zoom in here, but again, it's a simple, you know, it's a fairly simple game, you know, based uh, improvements made, obviously, by Gilbert, but it's going to be pretty straightforward here. Um, but there are, there are special rules uh, in there, but I'll just give you a quick scan. Again, this is a, a, a mid-draft. It will be updated, uh, but again, it gives you a good flavor of the game. Um, we've already started the layout work again, pretty straightforward system with some wrinkles added to it and uh, several pages of an example of play are included as well. So here we're on page 12 with special rules and that's pretty much, we're already in examples yeah. of the no, battle procedures. Yeah. There's no separate playbook because the, the yeah. game is not complicated enough. This, these illustrations help show how combat works. So hopefully here, everybody will get a little bit of a better view here. Just there's an example of a detailed battle resolution. And it yeah, goes on for several pages. Yeah. The bottom right picture is a good illustration. Like in War at Sea, if you had 12 vessels and the other fellow had 12 vessels, all 12 vessels shot at each other. But even in the days of Age of Sail, if you had uh, a line with 20 ships of the line, it was very hard to bring all 20 ships to bear. And in many instances, they didn't. And in my game, not all of your ships will be able to be brought to bear. As mm -hmm. they are sunk or break off, you can advance ships up the line, but it'll be rare you use every single ship, which is what I wanted to show. And I don't know if this would be for paper wars, because I don't think it's in the game, uh, adding a layer of rules around leadership for naval. Only in the sense that ships have to be assigned to their particular squadrons. Oh, that's true. You've got the squad. Yeah, you've done the squadron yeah. organization. I, right, I was going to, I originally had a sheer counter and a Jellicoe counter, but I mean, what do they do, you know? Yeah. Do uh, raiders show up in the game? Or yes. They, get, they do. Yes. The I want to give the Germans a few options that they didn't exercise, but players will want to. You take a ship like the Gobin or the Von. I was going to say the Gobin's included. The ship Gobin's the, included. The Gobin is, has is special rules for turn yep, yep, one. Yep. Yes. Yep, Gobin yep. can escape to Turkey and join the Turkish Navy and become the uh, uh, Yavuz Selim instead. Or it can stay in the Mediterranean and operate out of uh, Pola, Yugoslavia. What did you learn about the naval uh, engagements in Germany, East Africa? Did you find them interesting? I did find them interesting, but we've seen games covering that period already. I think the old game Far Seas covered the uh, Von Spee's breakout into the Pacific. That's a whole different game in itself. I could have had that as an option, but my map then practically would have to be of the world. And, you know, what would you be able to show then? So yeah, many, this is great. Many pages, that battle example is very uh, detailed guys. It's, oh gosh, four or five pages long. And yeah. there's the room 40 intelligence, fire markers, German dreadnought, special rules. Yeah. Um, I don't think we'd get into crossing the T though, or Zeppelins, right? Uh, no, I would have loved to add Zeppelins and crossing the T, but wow. The scale. Somewhere along the line, you got to cut it out, eh? Yeah, maybe there could be a paper wars. Like I said, if there if there's yeah. some if there's some uh, you know, and actually, I, I I see it often on Board Game Geek. People will take, especially a game that's meant to be uh, streamlined, not sure. overly detailed, not getting into too many special yeah. circumstances because the rules start piling up. I know people create their own fan base right. uh, rules and add-ons and enhancements. But well, uh, a, fr a friend of mine, he says, "Gilly, you're gonna be adding the aircraft carrier Engadine." Like, oh, Harry, it was one aircraft carrier and it was experimental and it didn't do much. And no, the Engadine is not in there. 
<laughs> and Shin's making a comment here. And I know uh, I saw Jack Green actually was, uh, he's been commenting. Thanks for uh, joining us, Jack, very much. And uh, Jack's a really uh, good, renowned expert on World War One naval. Yeah. Uh, having done Fleet Admiral. So he, sure. he's got a whole Fleet Admiral project that gets into the tactical level of many, many scenarios around oh, Japan yeah. and other things. Well, Jack I, will tell uh, you that I that poor old Gilbert here had trouble even filling out some of Jack's logs. They were that complicated. <laughs> Yeah, and then just as I know people are asking, uh, I, I see your comments here. War for America, uh, those rules are uh, haven't been shared yet because they're going to be uh, rolled out with our Kickstarter next week. So we'll have the War for America rules that I spoke with Gilbert about to the, tonight. Uh, we'll definitely have them for you guys. They're going to be on the Kickstarter page, uh, just to let you know. And we're just we're just reserving it for that Kickstarter uh, Kickstarter launch which is what we traditionally do with every uh every game as we include the rules with when the kickstarter hits so i just wanted to let everybody know i didn't want everybody to keep searching and and get frustrated looking for it uh and then let me see here's an observation i haven't read yet I make the area boxes connected by lines for strategic combat around the world a la gmt plan orange i'm not familiar with plan orange but no, I, I, i'm not familiar with that game either yeah so maybe that's something uh to look at i don't know if that would uh, fit in here uh, uh, <laughs> Russ is poking fun, like how tactical it's a strategic level, oh, yeah. you know, meant to be a, a abstract game with yeah. you know, a good sense of strategy, not you know, more than checkers, but yeah, we also don't get into advanced squad leader yeah. uh, naval action. <laughs> I wonder much. if Russ is referring to the young boy who was killed at Jutland, he saved the oh, ship. Good. Oh, yeah. It could be, huh? Yeah. could be. That could be the case. Yeah. Uh, what about the player aid? So I'm going to show here for everybody uh, charts and tables for the game. I want to give everybody sort of a advanced sneak peek here. So I'll zoom, I'll zoom in even more so people can sort of read this a little bit on air. Here. Yeah, so maybe the, you, can, the, the you can walk through yeah. these charts and tables. Well, the engagement table, that's the one I was saying. You might, you might have six squadrons, but you're going to roll on this uh, table to see how many of them come to bear. Because that's the problem that Jellicoe and Shear had. You've got 27 ships all in a line covering what? 10, 10 miles long? What about the guy in the rear? He might not necessarily be able to bring his guns to bear. Having the ships and bringing them to bear is the whole idea of naval warfare. All right. and, There's uh, the mine combat, merchant shipping. Thanks, uh, by the way, to John for giving us more information on Plan Orange. I do remember now that was a C3I. Oh, Plan so, Orange, yes. Yeah, yes. thanks for reminding us of that, yeah, John. I yeah, I plan Let's it. look at the next. I might have to zoom out on this one, actually. Yeah, so there's you can, your task this is that. This is that yeah. squadron chart you were talking about, yeah. the organization, right? So the bulk of your ships will be sitting on that chart if you're using the squadrons correctly. All right, and then just to zoom in so everybody can just see this for a moment. Again, nice uh, artwork uh, by uh, Newt. Got the little uh, ocean effect behind you there. Yeah, Newt did a nice, nice job on those did a really nice job, color tones, some oh. uh, special rule there. Just a reminder to make make sure you don't forget that rule that involves the Gobin. And then we've got the Entante forces, same same concept here. here. Here's the kind of charts that I can make in my home computer. There you go. That's a great play test chart right there. Newt I'll, I'll try to make them really nice. There you go. I love that. We'll, we'll put that in as a bonus. Those, yeah, uh, those that order direct Kickstarter will <laughs> we'll throw in your play test materials. It's would be a, a sure, sure win-win there. Absolutely. So then we'll just round out here. I think we just have a, oh, okay. Then can you explain what the German shipyards all about? Um, oh, when you put your damaged ships there, that because uh, when you put the damage, you know, how many games have we played where you got damaged? Lots of uh, usually a big picture of a game with a bunch of mark counters, right? Uh, off it's to the like side. Flying, flying colors, as much as I love that game, when you start playing it and get all those hit markers and broadside fired, it's all I've got a shipyard here. You got your damaged ships, just put them on this card and they'll be out of your way. You know? Was that your idea to do that image? I love that image of the shipyard. Well, me and uh, I, I sent two images to, to Newt and he said, Gilbert, can you can you find me a picture of a World War One German shipyard? That's I said, awesome. Uh, no. <laughs> I looked. I said, That's a shipyard. I don't know if it's German or not. Oh man, that's awesome! I, I think I, Jer, I think Newt chose that one though. Oh, look at this! Yeah, here's, here's the British. Yeah, love it. Awesome, awesome stuff. So it's just a card. You just put your wounded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put your counters on, but that's good. You know, people for play sessions, you know, and or even on video, 
people yeah. doing whether it's video or camera shots uh, it's adds a nice adds a nice touch and again it's going to have a mounted map and everything so i think i didn't uh, know that i didn't know that high speed split was going to be mounted yeah i believe so because it's a single map so what we typically do i mean there could be exceptions now and then but typically what we'll do and you know bill will make the final call if there has to be an exception made but yeah. traditionally anything that's a single map game we now we're, we're now really doing everything mounted that's a yeah. single map we want to give the best possible quality and people do seem to want the mounted maps with the thicker counters uh, that are all printed overseas. So yeah, we're it's going to get that nice, uh, nice treatment. I'm, I'm quite sure, and then uh, it'll be yeah, it'll be quite something. It looks well, like yeah, it's going to be fill a gap because I mean, Compass is known for its World War One land games, but you know how many World War uh, World War One naval games are there? Well, yeah, you know how Bill just hates World War One, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's his favorite I'm, historical I'm era by far is World War One. So. Yeah, I hope this game will fill that niche because there's no absolutely. World War One strategic games. Ab absolutely. You know, as absolutely. much as I love Avalon Hill, you know the '67 one. You know, I'm too old to get on my knees and I'm playing on the floor. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this will definitely, yeah, let's, yeah. So just so everybody knows, it's just good to bring up as a reminder, anything that has more than one map, it's going to usually be always a paper map based uh, product from Compass, you know, any monster game, et cetera, like Third World War, which has six uh, maps. Wow. <laughs> so we're not doing six mounted maps. No, <laughs> it's oh, a $500 shipping fee, right? Something like that. We're not going for World and Flames Collectors Edition Premium Deluxe, Uber Deluxe. So but yeah, we're we're looking to do the thicker counters and the mounted map, and that's that's across the board for anything. That's a single map, to be honest. If it's a single map, we're going to do that. Um, yeah, you know what? I would say, given, uh, and this is a bill question, but you know, if you think about several months for the printing, and then we've got to coordinate uh, on the shipping containers, get as much product on a single container as possible, in terms of running the business that 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 Bill's doing, you know, to make sure we maximize investment in the containers. You know, I, I'm sure this would be, and then, and then, of course, Bill's already got what 12 to 15 games in the warehouse wow. already done, which he he reminds he he likes to you know remind people of that that he's trying to control the flow of inventory. So yes, this this would definitely be a 2023 release. I'd be shocked if it was this year, just because you've got to take. It's not done yet. It's very close to being done. But then it's got to go overseas for several months before we get it back. And then we've got to put it into the queue. And like I said, our queue has, we usually traditionally have 12 games constantly, at least 12 in the queue constantly. And we're probably trying to keep it that way. So, but yeah, it won't be long. Everybody stay healthy and happy and play War for America and some other products for a year. And then you'll be mm -hmm. ready for, you'll be ready for Gilbert's game. And then there'll be another Atkinson book probably out too for War for America, mm -hmm. probably as well so uh let's see what else we have here so yeah so i think uh yeah it comes in a suitcase if you get all the maps mounted mm -hmm. that would be it would be a suitcase it wouldn't be a box anymore so what have i not brought up here so i there, i'm going to end on one note so i want to thank everybody because it's been over an hour but um i've seen uh, a really consistent feedback first people love hearing what you've got to say they love your youtube channel which we talked a lot about last time in oh, yeah. november um, but I think people are really interested to know, given just the quality of the design work they've seen, what's going to come for War for America, they're going to experience firsthand themselves, and then what, obviously, they've seen this now. They're really interested to know, what are your thoughts about future projects? That's, I think, the number one question I'm sensing right now, is well, what are you thinking for the future now that we've got these two? Well, I'm going to call these back, back burner projects. I discussed with Bill a little bit about them. And uh, again, no one's done this before. It's a tactical game on the Indian Wars, and I'm calling it Soldier and Brave. And oh. it's going to be tactical. So we're talking, you know, platoons and companies. Th that's a back burner project. Um, I've been working on it for a couple of years because in one year I visited all the Indian cavalry battlefields in the West, and there's there's tons of them. So that's a back burner project. And then I'm working on another Jutland game, but I want to go to squadron level where I'm making these hexagons with oh. squadrons and no board. You'll actually move the. Oh, nice. I get it. To make yeah. A, yeah. Exactly. You know I mean? I've yeah. seen that done with some games, but those are back burner projects. They may never see the light of day. I don't know yet. All right. looks like you got some artwork on. Is that the American Revolutionary War? I see some artwork behind your War for oh, America back, game the, box. The, the darker one is that's the death of Wolf at Quebec. That's a famous uh, painting by Benjamin West. 
And the greenish one with the death of Brock, that's the cover of the first edition of my book, a guidebook to the historic sites of the War of 1812. There it is. Yep, I see that. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I just want to zoom in on that to uh, uh, see that. And then, uh, yes, uh, people would love to know, since you've, you're playing U.S. Civil War right now for Mark Simonich, does, yeah. that, does that whet your appetite for doing your own American Civil War game? You know, for the first time, no. Uh, a lot of people have asked me that. They said, Gilbert, we'd like to see your take on the Civil War. But you know what? I'm playing what, in my opinion, is the best Civil War game right now, GMT's uh, Mark Simonich's. I know War for the Union is quite good. I have it yeah. mint and punched, never even played it. It's because I've I've got the the sirloin steak game of the Civil War. <laughs> I, I want to try and not. All right. <laughs> you know, I, gotcha. I, I love <laughs> U.S. Civil War. No, I couldn't offer anything new. To the civil oh, all right all right and then uh, john wants to know he thought you had done something around gunslinger cowboy style type of game yes i've already invented one but that's not for publication i call it a spaghetti western because i was a spaghetti western fan i've got all the clint eastwood movies all the spaghetti Western. oh do you really oh, i love I've clint eastwood uh, movies they're awesome i've got them all plus oh my, at least 60 others that the italians made that never made it to america and wow. uh, i made really? a man, man game on it and we play it at our local can games convention here in Ottawa. So I get to play it once a year. So, uh, but no, oh, wow. I, That's so, it, that is so awesome. It could never be published because all the cards are the characters in the movies, the actual photographs. So again, oh my gosh, that is so neat. Oh, the copy that sounds great. Nuts trying to, to get it. Eh? Oh my so, gosh. That, that is so cool. If well, I ever get the show again, I'll, I'll show you some of the cards and you'll go, yeah, that will never be published. You know? well, listen, we're really excited about, uh, both projects. I did want to pull up quickly for everybody. I don't know why I couldn't find it for some reason. So let me just go to the project site really quickly because I did want to share with everybody uh, the cover for uh, the proposed cover for High Seas Fleet, which is actually, to be oh, honest, God. yeah, I've got it right here. So he did um, a nice job on the cover. Yeah, so here you go, everybody. Sorry, I didn't have that yeah. teed up for you. That's um, right. It's, it's like it's also on the rules, but. Yeah. Um, that's what we got for the cover for the Kaiser's High Seas Fleet. So yeah, again, this will be rare, free... It's a rare yeah. picture of that one. You don't get too many close-up views of the German. That's a great. That's a great. I was going to say that's a great shot. And I haven't seen it before this cover oh. was done. I have not seen this shot before. Yeah, and um, the poor game has had so many name changes. It was called just High Seas Fleet. Then I called it the Kaiser's yeah. High Seas Fleet. And then I added the byline, the Great War at Sea, and so that's the final title. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is a great, a great cover. And again, uh, we're not going to have this on kick uh, on pre-order right away because we're still sort of wrapping it up. And and Bill wants to make sure games are pretty much fully done. So we're not going to have this on pre-order right away, but it will definitely be this year. Just to let everybody know, you know, we'll definitely get the game on pre-order later this year. Uh, but I, I hopefully everybody really uh, enjoyed learning about the game. We just want to introduce it for what you've been working on. And hopefully some of the artwork we've shown has given everybody an idea of what you're what you're aiming for and the quality of the project itself. Mm -hmm. So I hope everybody's excited about that. And we'll leave it with one last question for you, sure. uh, Gilbert, tonight. And then uh, this is a fun question from Alan. Uh, if you are left alone on a desert island for one year only, just one year, so you get uh, to come back to your collection, what game are you taking with you just for uh, that uh, one year? See, if I answer this honestly... I'm, I'm sliding uh, compass because my favorite game is, is a uh, civil war by Mark. That's okay. No, that, that's, that, that's, I that's, just, I find that's a masterpiece. That's great. I'm odd man out here. I play the standard game of us civil war, not with the advanced naval rules. I find the advanced naval rules are finicky and they uh -huh. don't add anything to it. Just play the stock game. It's wonderful. Well, Fred, thank you so much. Thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you, Fred, for the yeah, comment. Thank Thanks. you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everybody, really. Thanks for spending some time with us tonight. Uh, I hope this was enjoyable. And also, I hope uh, it might be of interest to you to first get a little bit caught up on War for America because it will be on Kickstarter probably next week is what we're expecting. You'll have the rules available next week when we do that. And then hopefully this introduction to the Kaiser's High Seas Fleet, uh, World War One strategic level, knowing what it's about, uh, Yes, you know, we're looking forward to getting that game out sometime next year. We'll get it on pre-order later this year. So thank you so much, everybody. Gilbert, stay thank safe. You. Enjoy enjoy the truckers. Have a nice meal. Yeah, yeah. Them, whatever. Stay have a Ottawa. Okay. Yeah, you're gonna have a lot of friends outdoors probably for a while. Hope everything works out for you. Right. I know it's a little crazy right now. We wish you all mm -hmm. the best. 
All and right. it was great as always having you on tonight. So thank you so much for joining us again. It's been too long. It's been yeah. almost what, at least a year and a half. So it was great to have you back on live tonight. And I'm sure we'll have you on again when we get closer to uh, to high seas fleet sure. uh, shipping or being released. We'll have you always on nice again. talking to you, you John. And uh, All right, thanks. Take care. All right. Good, okay, good night, bye -bye. everybody. We'll be back next Thursday night for our next town hall with Bill Thomas. Good night, everybody. Good night, Gilbert. Good take night. care. Bye bye.